I think as an entrepreneur, if you want to get the max value, at least for the businesses like yours and mine, that you can scale yourself. Right. I never just thought it made sense to, to dilute the equity. I'd rather just have it and reinvest those profits back into our own things has been the best return on investment I've had. So I'll, I'll bet on our team and ourselves of what we have going. Today, we're going to talk about golf. But before we do that, let me give you some background on myself and why I brought on today's entrepreneur. When I left my job in corporate America, I worked at an insurance giant. When I started evaluating if I could leave and start my own insurance company, I was met with the following objections from others. You won't get these kinds of customers. You'll have to go downstream to smaller clients. You need the resources that our multi-office, 20,000-plus employee organization brings to the table. That's where you work now, and that's the only reason you're getting these clients, John. You won't even get prospect meetings because they never heard of you. I was being told all of this by peers, friends, colleagues, and family. It was conveyed to me in a way that came across as if they were worried and concerned about my well-being. Why leave a good job for something that is going to fail? And a few genuinely did feel this way, but most didn't. What I learned was that the vast majority of the people chiming in on this were scared of me succeeding, not worried for me about failing. You see, me succeeding is an indication that they are wrong in their own life choices. Well, shit, what if John goes out and makes a million dollars? I never made that move and I don't make a million dollars. We come from the same place. We have the same experiences. We have the same opportunity. Shit, if he does something different and it works out for the better, that means I fucked up. I had to look past it and focus on the business itself. Were they right that I can't get clients of decent size if I don't work for a company that has been around for 100 years and has 20,000 employees? Is this true? Well, nobody working on the accounts of the many clients I brought on there had 100 years of experience. I mean, I had six. And I did all the damn work. So that's off the table. The other 19,999 employees that were there didn't really effing matter when it came to the client experience. All I needed to do now is make sure that prospective clients understand this as well. And shit, I got a business. Let's fucking go. I quit my six-figure job in 05. By 2010, I had a 2,000% raise. By 2015, I sold it to a private equity firm and created generational wealth for my great-grandkids. Yeah, me and my handful of employees dominated a niche space in a very crowded, established industry. And now I don't work. That's my story. I'm bringing a man onto the show right now that is still telling his story but I see a lot of parallels to mine already. He is dominating a very competitive, corporately dominated, well-established space, and he found a way to coexist in this space with a niche focus. Sounds very familiar to me. Jason Highland, founder of Sub70 Golf, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, hey, man, let's let's talk some golf. And I was kind of kidding with uh, with my colleagues over here. This is going to come across like um, like a like an English professor with a Ph.D. speaking to an, an illiterate teenager. OK, yeah, that illiterate teenager maybe read a couple books here and there. Uh, yeah. So me, I've uh, I've played in some golf scrambles and um, I kind of just gave it up completely around 25 years old. Still found a way to find myself with chronic golfer's elbow, but it's not from playing golf. I will tell you that. Anyhow, man, let, let, let's give you some street credit right off the gates. I, I think a lot of our listeners 
the ones that are in the know are in the know, right? With sub sub seventy, and we're, we're going to get into what sub sub seventy is and and all of that. But a good portion of our listeners, and they very well might be golf fans too, uh, ha- have have no idea about sub seventy. So before we get into that, let's give you some street credit. Could you talk about your background and all your days leading up to where you're at now? Yeah. So, you know, like I always joke, I have not had a real job since 17 years old. So I worked in golf my whole life. So started off, you know, playing golf and working in the pro shops. And then uh, in college, I was lucky enough to work for it was called SMT Golf. It was a golf component company. So we sold the parts and shafts and grips. And then when I was going to school in the mid 90s, I uh, went to University of Wisconsin, Oshkosh, and um, the internet was coming out. So you could sort of see, and I lived with a couple of computer science majors, so you could sort of see how this catalog business sort of thing could expand out. So then um, I started my first company at 22, which is still around today, called Diamond Tour Golf. And we mimicked what I worked in because I had the experience of selling the parts. So we sell the shafts and grips and heads and supply people in that business is still here. We run three different golf companies. So we started off with that and grew the company. And then in 2008, we started Hurricane Golf, which is sort of like, imagine like a TJ Maxx of golf online with all of the, I'll use air quotes, major brands. I can't see that. Major brands, (laughs) the big boy brands you've heard of. And a lot of times at the end of quarters or at the end of a, a product life cycle, just like how stuff winds up at TJ Maxx, they'll sell to us in large volume. And then we just use Amazon, our website, eBay, Walmart, and you're shipping those products out. So once again, it's a hub and spoke internet-based business. And then Sub70 started as a passion project. Sub70, we're going to get into, but let, let's have a, a little bit of fun. We know, I know I got some golf listeners. I don't know a lot about golf, although although my, our first episode, I had an NFL player on the show that I met at a golf outing where they gave us free PXGs, and we had a little laugh about that. But besides that, golf's never come up on the, sh- on the show. So, so I, I want to appeal to the, uh, the appetite of our golf fans a little bit. Let, let's have a little fun with this. I went to golf.com. According to golf.com, Jason, in 2022, the top eight golf courses in America. You tell me if you agree or disagree or anything okay. you got to say about them. Cypress Point Club, California. They have it as number one. I've, I've been fortunate enough to play it. Okay. And some of these I may have not played, right? They're hard to get out on, right? Once more are very, very, they're private and then very, very private. Cypress Point is one of the greatest golf courses. One of the, the most beautiful venues you can ever play you know, out on, you know, that Carmel area where Pebble Beach is at. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's a masterpiece. Yes. I would have guessed this is number one, but that's because I don't know anything. Pebble Beach. It's it's great. Like right. I've been fortunate enough to play that and it's right next to Cyprus. The views, I always call it like playing golf uh, in like, it's like theater. You've seen the holes of Pebble Beach so many times if you're a golf fan. And then when you step on the tee, it looks like you would imagine it. Okay. It takes forever. The round of golf is like six and a half, seven hours. And you don't give a shit. Like you're, it's so beautiful. And you're just like, so you don't even notice because I normally hate slow golf. Okay. I could be out there for 10 hours and it's just the most wonderful walk and experience. It's fun, absolutely fantastic. I, I can't imagine 10 hours of, cause I tend to drink when I golf. I mean, 10 hours of drink. I mean, uh, anyway, well, um, you just have like a nice wine when you're out there, right? Maybe okay. some cheese. You know, like it's, it's very classy. So you would just, you know, have a little sip and enjoy the experience, but it's so beautiful. No, no one's really doing is. shots of Malort or doing keg stands. It's a like wine and cheese <laughs> no, kind of thing. All right. There's room for that in golf and I'm for it, but at Pebble, <laughs> it would be like, you know, you want to stay somewhat sober for the experience of, you know, enjoyment. <laughs> is that good? Got it. The last one, Nebraska, Sand Hills Golf Club. I was, you know, interested that it was Nebraska. It was kind of, kind of interesting. So I would put that as my favorite golf course I've ever played. And oh, I spend a lot shit. of time out in that okay. region. Yeah. And so you, most people don't realize it. In the northwest section of Nebraska, and I spend about 30 days a year out there. I'm a member at a club next to um, Sand Hills called the Dismal River Club. And it's all sand-based and mountainous. So you're not sand mountains. They call the sand hills region. You can't farm anything. It's all cattle ranches. But it's perfect for inland lakes golf because it's sand-based, so the ball will bounce. And the the rolliness of the topography makes it look like you're in Scotland kind of playing, but you're in the middle of the country. So it's some of the best land for that style of golf. Now, it's in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you're 50, 60 miles from gas stations. You know, you broke a leg. It's an hour and 45 minute drive to the nearest hospital. Wow. But that's what makes it so beautiful to go spend time out there at because you won't see a power line. 
you won't see any infrastructure at Sand Hills or at Dismal. Mm -hmm. The courses are just out on their own, you know, and it's in the topography looks like something from Yellowstone. We should see like Rip coming over the side with like a dead body or something like they shot dances with wolves out in that area. So a lot of cowboy movies get made out there. So it looks like it did in 1860 or 1880. If you're taking, you know, a wagon across the plains or yeah. going to that region, it's untouched. So it's, it, the, the, the topography is gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful out there. I love it. I That's love awesome. it. You know, I heard it's beautiful out there. I've been out to Omaha a couple of times. I was at the College World Series once, and I was at uh, in Lincoln for a, a Nebraska Cornhusker game, I think, once at least. So um, the topography looks totally different than okay. that. I'll, I'll I'll text you a picture. Of you you'll be like, "That's Nebraska." It like, looks really? like you're in Montana. Okay, yeah. interesting. Oh, wow. Would not have so known that, that golf course is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. So switching gears here, man. And I had cut you off earlier. You started talking about sub seventy initially being a passion project for you. Maybe maybe we should start there. So I had the other two companies, right? So that's what made my living. And we had the facility and I had the experience at this point. And I was in my early 40s, you know, mid, mid early 40s when we first started the idea. I'm 49 now. And it was like, OK, I want to build. I think there is a niche as the direct to consumer brands started coming out, say, 10 years ago. Like if you thought direct to consumer, you thought maybe less quality, cheaper alternative sort of scenario. Right. And then it started changing where it didn't become that anymore, meaning that the quality of direct-to-consumer got, got much better, and the brands were not perceived to be as low end or even middle of the road. They were doing some higher-end brands. Like the, a brand I studied, which gave me inspiration for the golf clubs, was a brand called Combatant Gentleman that did suits. I saw the guy on CNBC. He used to work for Hugo Boss, and he's like, you don't even really want to know what it costs to make a thousand dollar Hugo Boss suit at the factory. You know, you're spending way more on the stores and all the rest of it. So what he did is he started a company. He knew how to make suits. They come into their warehouse in California and they're like 200 bucks. Okay. The suit comes to you. You have to get it tailored locally. So you have to go through one more step, but he's like, it's the equivalent of an $800, a lower end Hugo Boss suit, right? It's way better than a $200 suit you'd buy at a retail store. So I dress like this most of the time with hoodies and, you know, <laughs> dress up. I'm an internet dude, right? So I needed a new suit. So we, we ended up buying them one of these suits after I saw on CNBC. And like, legitimately, I didn't feel like it was, you know, like I didn't feel like the packaging was cool. The website was cool. I didn't feel like I was buying a, a shitty suit. Right. And once I got it tailored, it was really nice. So I'm like, you know, 300 bucks in this whole suit. And my wife's like, you look great. It looks great. I have a Hugo Boss suit. And she's like, the quality, the fit, it looks absolutely the same. I'm like, all right. If I feel like this with a suit, because no one wants, I don't want to wear a cheap suit. I don't need a five thousand dollars suit, but right. I want it to fit nice and the material to hang nice when I'm going out with my wife in Chicago. Yep, I want to look decent. I can do this with golf clubs. Okay. So then the inspiration came from doing it higher end and boutique and everything custom made here in Sycamore, and kind of having these like almost make them like pieces of art. I thought to myself, if we can do this and feel good about buying a suit, I can do this with golf clubs and design some really high-end, boutique-ish, unique kind of stuff, offer really, like, we wanted to have an internet-based company with, like, Nordstrom level of service, where you're not just an, an, a customer number, we know your game, a human picks up a phone quick, my, my cell number was out there everywhere, and let's try to take this customer service aspect and custom build all of these clubs and make that experience better than just going into a store and buying it. And we can offer a much better value because it's most golf club companies, I call it, call it there's nothing wrong with it, like we said, but it's like a 1950s distribution model. Goes to a pro shop or a store, they mark it up another 50%, yep. and then the customer buys it. Well, we don't, we're hub and spoke. It comes from us to you. There's no middle person, kind of like the suit idea. And the tricky part is how do we thread the needle to make it feel boutique-ish and cool and different, but it's direct to consumer. So the price isn't as high, but it's certainly a cheap club. So then that's the tricky marketing part of how do we, how did we accomplish this? How do we get that messaging out? And, you know, we've been fortunate enough to do it. So that was kind of the inspiration that I wanted to kind of build. I said, we always want to build Aston Martins and how do, how can we do it in the golf industry? Right. But kind of do it differently. 
What, and what do you mean by that with Aston Martins? What, what, why are you saying that? Why, why do you? Oh, just like, you know, the crash, like the beauty, like the lines. We wanted to be like understated elegance. Where we use yeah. a lot of milling yeah. and just we bring art, try to bring art to make it look like a sub 70 club. So a lot of times rather than cutting costs, we increase the cost of the product. So when you get that product, we wanted to open that box yeah. and you look at that club and go, my God, is that beautiful? Sort of like, so our inspiration is always like, we weren't yellow Ferrari. We were a beautifully tailored suit of a of an English gentleman driving a silver Aston Martin in the English countryside is sort of like <laughs> the inspiration for the I, club, I, right? Brother. Like, I, that's the look. Understated. Like, we're not screaming, right? Yeah. It's just, if you see it, you know. Dude, that's, I love that. That's why I jumped on that where you said Aston Martin, man. Okay. So when I first started making some money, like good money, like 07, 08-ish, I'm like, oh, I've arrived. I'm going to go buy a freaking Aston Martin or a Ferrari and mm. blah, blah, blah. Dude, go buy a Ferrari. It didn't really fit in it properly. So I go try to Aston Martin. I was going to get the Vanquish, either the DB9 or the Vanquish. Didn't fit yeah. in that. I'm like, you mother effer. And ended up finding a Maserati Grand Sport that I actually fit in because I can move the seat all the way back. I'm, I'm a big dude. But uh, I, I, I love, I, I totally, this is what's cool about Aston Martin's, man. Not You got to be a little bit in the motherfucking no, dude. Not everybody knows what an Aston Martin is, okay? And don't, and then I, don't they just have like beautiful ele- – it's nothing try too hard. It's just like right. it's an Aston. You just – you know, you see it, the back end of it, and it's sporty, but there's some just beautiful something. British lines to it. There's freaking something about it, man. And I'm seeing there now is. people – a lot of people are driving those Corvettes, I'm noticing now, that almost look like – they almost look like more like Lamborghinis than Corvettes yeah. to me, those new ones. Um, there's something about Aston Martins, though, that just pop. Something about and, an Aston Martin. Silver know. Aston Martin, man. I don't know if it gets any prettier than that. Well, and they're still not mass producing it. You know, freaking my damn ass buys that freaking Maserati. Think, oh, what's a Maserati? Nobody in Chicago had Maseratis. I just shipped that mother from freaking Texas. Whoa, what is that? What is that? Well, fuck, two years later – there's freaking Maserati dealerships mass producing them in freaking yeah. Schomburg. You know what I mean? But whatever. Anyway. Yeah, yeah they've got like a baby. really cool. I, I, get, I gave that thing up two years ago. I'm like still sad about it. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> you, you know, you just you just don't see them that often. Yeah. And when you do see an Aston Martin, to me, it looks different than all the other sports cars out there. Like, I love the lines of them. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Yep. Hey, man, we, we, we definitely agree. We definitely agree on this. And, you know, one of the things on your website that you kind of just touched on, but I, I, I had picked it up immediately and you talked about combating gentlemen and how you kind of got this idea. Maybe, OK, you're, you're, you're a serial entrepreneur, Jason, even though it's been all in the golf space, really, you're a serial yeah. entrepreneur. And and for you to see another industry, the suit industry of all industries to kind of make that light bulb go off in your head. Well, shit, why can't we do this in in golf where, where you already right. are? And as you said, you had other multi, you had other lines of income already. You, you already had money being made. You could take this chance over here on something that you think is pretty freaking cool, and um, and then boom, you know, you, t- you turn around, turn it around into a, into its own, um, you know, its own business. I mean, yeah. Now this one's bigger than the other two combined, which is yeah. so strange, right? Like, yeah, the hobby project turned into you know a real company. Boom, and I, yeah. see, and I, and I love that, and, and I knew that. That's why. That's why I invited you on the show. If, if this was just like your little side gig, that you wouldn't be on our show. Just, just so you know, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding around. You have a cool story, regardless of of the success you're having. But but I, I we are going to get into that. But real quick here, you, you, you talked on your website. There was a time when you knew the person who crafted your golf clubs. You, you kind of give like this old world. I kind of like pictured myself like. In Godfather 2, when Michael's on the countryside going down the road to get freaking cheese yeah. or something like that. I mean, was this like, what are you referring to on your website? When was this happening that you knew the person making your golf club? In Scotland, right? Oh. So when all the clubs were hand built in Scotland at local places, that's how it started. You would go to your local craftsman and they would build a hand built set for you. That's wow. how it used to all be done before they were completely mass produced by all of the major manufacturers. So it's kind of a reference back to yeah. you know the 1800s, early 1900s in Scotland of how master club builders would build clubs for guys. Oh, there you go. That's pretty damn cool. Yeah. And then you know, and so you're you're bringing back the old school, which is, I mean, that's that's pretty cool in itself. Well, right? we wanted to bring back service to the industry we knew we could have an advantage because the bigger companies they it, it's just you know not there's anything wrong with it but it's a machine right and we wanted it to be more boutique more special more hey i can call jason i can call cody i can call dan and they know who we are 
So we wanted to kind of bring like a boutique hotel sort of feel to the golf side of things where it's not as corporate. So did, wh- where did you stop following the combatant gentleman model? At, at some point, this takes a life of its own on, you know, you, you have the bulb. Are you market? Did you steal anything from them in terms of how they market or anything like that? Like, how are you going about getting your clients and uh, what's the process look like once you engage with them? Yeah. So we, you know, so it took like three years of getting from concept to like turning the company on, right? A product development. So the products have to work. If they don't work, this whole thing doesn't work, right? So you got to make sure when the, when the clubs go to the person, they look pretty and all that stuff and they're crafted by hand, but they got to play well. So we didn't rush that. We took our time. What did I learn from combatant gentlemen? Packaging matters. You know, they had really cool packaging that when you get the box, there's a bit of an experience in the box. So we have a handwritten thank you note. It's not produced by Massa for every order. We put a hat or some swag in there and stuff like that. And then we have, you know, custom made holders for the for the golf club. So when you get the box, we want that to be a part of the experience. Right. So we kind of took that from them. They did a great job with that. And to get the customers we started off, we, we followed like what a lot of, like not Rolex, which is like one of the greatest brands in the world, but some of the smaller niche watch companies. Which one are you wearing? Um, I think it's like Oyster Pearl or something like that. I don't yeah. know what it's called. Classic, right? It was greatest. Like, I mean, yeah. not them, but the, like your APs or your Ulysse Nardin or Panerai, right? Like how did they convey their messaging? Because it's usually quiet. They don't do TV commercials. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's more niche you know, Paul Picot, some of these other brands. And we sort of mimicked that of like, of smaller brands in the watch industry. We noticed it's all about quality. They're not loud, you know, it's, it's subtle. So our marketing has always been kind of like, we don't put a ton out there by design. We almost want people to think they found us, Mm. like you kind of discovered it. So you want it out there, of course, to everybody. We want everyone to enjoy the clubs and play it. But I'm not going to be like screaming on television about the stuff. Like we want it to be subtle. We got interviewed a lot, like in the golf industry when we started, because it was different and they need content. So we worked a lot with like the guys at My Golf Spy, which is like a huge, oh, review type website. So we kind of focused with review websites because we knew we had a good product and they need content. So we sent them clubs to test and, and then we had good reviews. And then we used that review to kind of put it out to our customers. And then the circle sort of, starts right it kind of starts twirling bigger and bigger and then i would say our best cost our best marketing has been happy customers so it's kind of like new school meets old school where if you like the clubs your buddies in your group see it they go wow that's different what's that hey call jay over at sub 70 yada 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 so it's kind of like new school and old school word of mouth but we yeah. don't want to be I, we don't want to be in front of people so much where it's like if i see one more goddamn commercial from sub 70 i'm gonna you know, want to punch the screen so yeah. you know you don't want to you want to be out there but not too much where you want people to feel like they kind of found you and it's a little bit different so so compare and contrast that to say like uh pxgs right so so yeah. your value proposition sounds a little bit similar from from the custom standpoint but yeah. they, they can't do the things you're doing like like the handwritten notes and all that shit although i will say when i got my px when I got my PXGs, I did post it on Instagram and tag them, and they mm-hmm. did respond to that and reposted it. Mm-hmm. So somebody is paying attention over there. I guess. Oh yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's we're. I would say our, we definitely have different feels, right? Like mm. he's definitely more high energy. You know, yelling at the. You know, there's a little bit more. How do you say it? Not showmanship mm. or more yellow Lamborghini, right? He's more yellow Lamborghini. We're more Aston Martin, so we're more quiet. Um, you can go both routes. It's a very well-written company. And we definitely, because they at first were not direct to consumer. Then they switched gears and went direct to consumer after we were direct to consumer. So they've kind of 180'd their direction. So to go direct to consumer. So they don't sell the partners anymore. And we haven't even gotten into your price point yet, Jason. But if you're following the combatant gentleman model, it sounds like you're trying to come in a little bit under what it would be a brick, brick and mortar. PXG is definitely, definitely higher, right? Where, where are you at in comparison to they have some different ways of doing it and it's 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 different to me so i don't want to judge but like they'll have some high end stuff then they'll like slash the price like 50% off for like 3 weeks like we never do a sale okay like we price it and that's it 
Okay. Like we do one sale a year for Cyber Monday for 24 hours. Otherwise, like there's no codes. There's no sort of like the watch companies do, right? Like this is the price. We, we try to price it fair. So they're more, not that there's anything wrong with it, but they're more, it's this price. Now we're going to slash for two weeks. Then we'll raise it back up then slash. So it's just a different way about, you know, going on it. But the product itself from PXG, it's a very good product, very well-ran company, definitely worthy competitor. And, you know, you got to tip your hat to Bob Parsons. He's a billionaire, you know, and then started this company. So once again, yeah. his business career, he's done, he's done <laughs> a hell of a lot more than I've ever accomplished. So, you know, if, if I met him, I would be like, well, bold, sir, like <laughs> nothing but respect. <laughs> you know, you, you had alluded kind of to word of mouth and customers just just talking about and and I'll share if, if if people haven't noticed a pattern, I usually have a connection of some sort with with our guests on the show. Jason and I have have a mutual friend. Uh, that's one of my LA friends, and he's actually spends a lot of time in uh, in uh, Miami as well. But he's a, a TV producer, entertainment type of guy. There's actually a character in the TV show Ballers that's based on him because he's that that well connected. And he and I had made friends over, you know, I, I won't say his name because hopefully he'll be on the show again, himself at some point. But but um, you know, you, you, when you got people just looking out for for other people, he he knew I had this show. He knew I spent half my time in LA, half my time in Chicago. Shit, you, you might already know my friend Jason, Jason Highland. <laughs> he just thinks like all the entrepreneur t- types in the Chicago land area know each other. <laughs> you no, know, I don't. Um, but he connected us, and and you know those warm referrals you get to people. It's just it's just such a damn difference. If if Jason's PR team. Would, not that they would have, Jason, but but if you had a PR team that well, it sounds like you don't even have a PR team because you had to do everything yourself. I don't have a PR team. <laughs> but let, let's say somebody that was interested in your in sub 70s well being decided to reach out to me and put you on the show. I'm, I'm not into golf, man. I didn't I never heard of sub 70, but but you know, it yeah. comes from a mutual person that has mutual respect for both of us. And like all motherfucking day, let's go, dude. I, I talked to my associate Brian. He's into golf and he made some calls. If one of his good buddies, Tyler, is a borderline, what is it? Not really pro, amateur, amateur golf, which I guess it encompasses. I'm an amateur. We're all amateur golf. Right? Right, exactly. But, uh, no, anyway, he's the guy everybody wants to be on their, their team at the scramble. And he, um, he knew exactly who Sub 70 was and went on and on about it. I would never even have made those secondary phone calls to look into you, Jason, if it, if it wasn't coming from a mutual acquaintance. So, you know, I, I think, um, you know, I leave the audience with you. You don't know the circumstances you're in and the impression you make on people, um, you know, good and bad, you know, you know, matters uh, for sure. I want to make sure that the audience captured a, a really key thing you said. All right. Quality first. Okay. And, 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 and in business, I, I refer to that as the blocking and tackling. You better have the basic shit down, man. This golf club better fucking work. Okay. Yes. You know, let's get there. And now, you know, let's make it look pretty. Let, let's make exactly. that package a way where people want to post it on Instagram, opening it up, or people want to give it as a gift. And let's put this handwritten note that makes the customer feel special. That yeah. motherfucker better work. It better be doing what you say it's yes. going to do, though. That that That's first. All the yes. other stuff is very, very important, but it's second. It's second, right? A thousand percent. The product has to perform or this experiment would have not worked. Yeah. It has to work. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so you got people feeling special they, they and then they go on golf with these things and they, yeah. they, they work. Okay. I'm a happy, I'm a happy dude. And yeah. what, what's really interested to me, Jason, is that you've been able to build a community. Okay. And I want you to talk a little bit about this because, you know, I, I it's one of the most difficult things for brands to do is build a community that people actually like give a shit about you know how, how do we get our consumers to to want to interact with each other all the brands try to do it you know what i mean i don't give a shit if i'm on the united frequent flyer mile uh program uh platinum level and you are too i don't want to like freaking go on a message board and talk about our experiences together i don't want to it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how much money united puts behind it it's not something of interest to me the the, the only time i've seen a brand at least for me successfully get this done is when I owned a Jeep Wrangler. 
I was like, I put the big 35 inch tires on it and the big freaking wheels and was, you know, had the big thing on the front end. And it was kind of like a little midlife crisis, you could say. And this thing was well, and everyone waves you with a Jeep, right? I had yeah. a Wrangler at one point. And they, 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 right. If you're broken down on the side of the road with a Jeep, another Jeep guy is going to come help you. Boom. You just freaking nailed it. And actually, that's what I already have in my note. The, the Jeep wave when i talked about i have golfer's elbow by the way i think it was from driving that jeep for three years and it hurt my freaking elbows no bullshit on that but you know there's the anyone that's had a wrangler like jason just said it's the wave the jeep wave you actually are acknowledging each other so so here jason you know i guess i guess two questions how did you build this community to talk about what i'm even referring to tell the audience about this camaraderie that your customers seem to have with each other and, and, and how do you plan to maintain that as as you get bigger First off, I'm I'm massively humbled by it, right? Like that people seem to really care and love this brand, right? And I don't really know how we did it. We we just set out, and I'll try to answer the best I can, like just make the experience for the customer and bring them into it, meaning give us your feedback. You know, we use their feedback of how to improve the next series of clubs, and we and we like we didn't bullshit people. Like we don't have product life cycles. We only bring it out. Like we tried to open the door behind it. Like if we can make it better, we'll bring a new one out. If we can't, we'll just tell you, I can't make it better. So I won't bullshit you and say, you're going to hit it 10 yards farther when I know it's not the truth. Yeah. So we're just brutally honest. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that helped where people are like, I kind of get where these guys are coming from. And then what we also tried to like, so like our Facebook group that was started by a customer. Like we don't even, we didn't even (laughs) do it. This is incredible. Like I mean, that's incredible. Thousand. Yeah, like a guy just like, hey, do you mind if I do this? And we're like, oh, fuck it, cool, like, great. But what we did, I think smartly, is we stay off of it. Unless somebody asks us a question, we don't try to turn it into a sub-70 uh, billboard. We're, we're very much let the customer speak, give us your feedback. Hey, if you need us, just message us. But we don't try to, like, push the topics or if someone has a problem, sure. We might like step in and be like, Hey, call Dan, call me. We'll help you. You know, just give us a buzz. That's otherwise we kind of just let it be and let it be natural. Sort of probably like how Jeep does with their guys where it takes a life on itself. And you know, what rims did you use and what aftermarket stuff are you and guys are sharing. And we even see like golfers like in different areas playing golf together from the community of it. Like they both live in Memphis or something. Mm -hmm. Right. And, so we've tried to just let it be natural and organic and not kind of, I like, but like it sounds about like, I don't want to ruin it. I, I yeah. love the passion that people have for it. And we just kind of let it just brew naturally. Yeah. You know, and I wasn't even planning on saying this, but listen, listening to your response there, this is kind of a freaking crazy analogy, but I think it works. Okay. Mark Zuckerberg with Facebook for years, there was no sponsored ads on Facebook for years. There was no freaking monetization of that damn thing. They didn't want to ruin it. <laughs> everyone, right. at, at some point, Jason, so everyone will be so hooked on sub 70 that you're going to be able to do whatever the hell you want. And you're going to be, uh, you know, right there with Zuckerberg. I, I'm, I'm kidding, obviously. And I know that's not even your end game with it, but, but um, th- th- there's something to be said with, we got to keep this damn thing cool, man. We, we don't want to uncool mm-hmm. this thing right now. It, it, yeah, and it's it's working, and 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 I don't want to uncool like this. It it was never, you know, it has to hit a certain sales goal or something. I mean, we're doing well beyond whatever we thought we would be at this point. So whatever, yeah. it's just kind of working. So it's almost like we can enhance things, but you almost just stay out of the way of it a little mm-hmm. bit and let it kind of speak to you right. of what the customers kind of want. They'll tell you that's the best part about direct to consumer business. Mm-hmm. We're in communication with the people all the time, Yeah, you know, or, you know, if somebody will recognize me at a golf course or something. They want to talk to me about it. I mean, I make sure I give them the time and I'm so humbled and appreciative and yep. let them, you know, Hey, what about this? And what are you doing with this? And I see that. And it's like, it's great. Like, I love that side mm-hmm. of it that, I think they feel like they're almost a part of the company or okay. they help guide the company. And, and ha- have you gone into getting any professionals involved with using your club? Have you gone that route yeah. or where? Yeah, your we have. yeah. So we, yes. And we don't go like huge because we always said, if I got to go pay a guy on the PGA tour, you know, 300 grand a year to play the irons, I got to charge you more for the clubs. <laughs> and we just been like brutally honest with people on that one. Like if you guys, if it's that important to you, we could do it, but the clubs are all going up by a hundred bucks a set. Okay. Everyone, everyone gather with that. What he just said, that's a huge point right there. Okay. Yeah. We could do this shit, man, but 
Not a, we, we got to. He's not saying I, I got to sell to the person using them, not the PGA star. He's saying if I pay him, all of you motherfuckers down here need to pay fucking more. It's starting tomorrow. Right. It just it comes to the bottom. You know, it's got to be a cost that's covered. Yeah. So what we've done is instead of on the PGA tour, it's way we can get the exposure we need. So it's important to know that people, or it's important I think that people know the clubs are played at a professional high level. So. Uh, one of our first guys we worked with, it's just been an honor because he's one of my heroes growing up and still like the wildest thing that you're friends with one of your heroes is Tommy Armour the third TA3. Still plays on Champions Tour and he helped us design an iron that we co-branded and he plays the clubs on tour. Um, you know, and, and that was doable because on the Champions Tour, the contracts for the clubs aren't as expensive. So we partnered in with Tom on that. But he still is like he played the PGA Tour for 28 years. He's a stylish dresser. He's kind of got like a John Wayne aura to him. Like he's perfect. He's a bit of a rebel. Okay. And our company is a little bit different. So we got Tommy on the Champions Tour, Cliff Kresge on the Champions Tour, and then Zach Fisher. It's a, a, he plays the Corn Ferry Tour. We we got hooked up with Zach before he even went through Q School, and he won Q School last year to get on the Corn Ferry Tour, had a great season, finished 34th on the money list. So he's kind of our Corn Ferry Tour guy. And it didn't cost a fortune, you know, to have Zach as a brand ambassador. So we still want people to know uh, we got some guys on the Challenge Tour over in Europe playing that the clubs can be pl- are played at the highest level of guys doing it for a living. But we don't need to go get a stable of 20 guys and then cost because we have to pass that cost on. Yep. Yeah. Right. So and then we think it's a little bit, you know, like on the Tom project, it's also cool where the pro helps design a certain club where his experience comes into this. Mm. So we tried to have like these passion projects where it's like not only is Tom a brand ambassador, but he's really working on these projects with all of his experience to bring you a club that he's put in his own bag. Yeah. That he has worked on from the start. So well, I got to think for, it's kind of like a cool way of doing it. I got to think a guy like TA3 too, where he's adding his just career progression. And this, yeah, that's freaking cool. I get to do this now. You know what I mean? Maybe he's he, not, you know, yeah. You know, so, yeah, he was very open to the idea. And it's like basically, you know, he doesn't need a day job, yeah. but he was like, this sounds fun. Right. Let's, let's, let's do this together. And we came out with a really good product, and you know he's very proud of it. And I'm proud to have the association with him. Like he's been so helpful. Well, Jason, you're you're a wise man, man. Because and it's obvious that you've run other companies before. I think a lot of times, new, newer businesses, especially when they start experiencing some success, make the mistake of dumping money into things that that will not have a return on investment. You know, I, I think a really common one is is tv ads you know what i mean like hey i have a roofing and siding company we're killing it let's try to scale now and let's go to comcast cable and do targeted art advertising and now we just dumped 40 grand into this over the next three months and how many jobs did we get out of it uh you know what i mean and and, and when you're a small company you're you're usually not gonna get the roi on shit like that it it makes sense for the big dogs because you're kind of building a brand and you want them to see your name here and then you want them to see your name again on the billboard and maybe when you sponsored some other shit or something you know what i mean and they're seeing your name seeing your name seeing your name but but when you're small man dumping money into stuff like that in my experience at least has just not been fruitful um and, and and that's really what's kind of cool about you, Jason, the, f- the fact that you're not doing it by trial. I didn't hear you say, oh, we did it and there was 80 grand gone and uh, now we're not doing it. You know what I mean? Your, your answer no, was you, we- you already knew not to. You said, no, if we do this shit, we got to raise the prices of our damn clubs. This is a, a decision that we're going to make. And, and, and the decision is basically no. And you found a way to kind of do it. So with that said, man, let's talk about your business. OK. And this all ties together. All right. Dude, I'm a freaking venture capitalist, bro. And I got entrepreneur after entrepreneur coming and trying to freaking raise money. And it, it's cool. I take the meetings. Trust me, it's fun listening to this stuff. But every so often, actually more often than you think, I'm looking at these guys. I'm like, uh, what's the money for that you're raising? Well, we're trying to do that. Dude, you don't need venture capital money right now, bro. This business is sustainable. Well, we're going to do this and hire these sales reps. No, 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 no. You're the sales rep. You get it to where it needs to be. Then take that money you just made and hire other sales reps with that money if you so choose. Why are you looking for outside investment money to help you build this when you haven't even proved the concept yet? 
big red red, red flag to me, big, big, big turnoff. Um, we're going to have a lot of people on this show, you know, a lot of times in the tech space, they need to build out a system or, or whatever. And yeah, money makes sense. You do need to raise money. I'm in a company right now that raised $7 million and, you know, whatever. It's finally coming to fruition where they're getting some big clients years later as, as a result of the system they built. Oh, thank God we're sweating there for a little bit. COVID was right in the middle of it. Oh, shit. <laughs> Is anyone going to use this thing? And, you know, now it's working. I'm always more impressed, Jason, with, with somebody that built a company like I did, man. I started that I started that insurance company for my kitchen table. I used the money that I made to go hire other people. Sometimes I got in front of myself. Right. I, 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 bought, I bought an assistant to her. I remember I was, I was grossing a certain amount of money. I could well afford an assistant, brought her in. I didn't have shit for her to do because I didn't trust her. I, I wanted to do everything. <laughs> you know. So that was right. 40 grand. Going to pay her 40 grand a year to just sit there and look at me. It was kind of weird. Um, so she quit. You know, She wanted more opportunity. But, but I, 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 guess, I guess my point is I scaled the company and invested more in the company with my own money that I was making. You know what I mean? And and you told me you haven't raised any money. You've bootstrapped this whole thing, man. Um, could, could you comment on what your philosophy is there? Exactly the same as it was what you're doing. So you always, in my opinion, as an entrepreneur, you have to, I mean, you, you live below your means, right? You don't, you don't go nuts. You know, we, we, we live just fine on, you know, I, I don't need a million dollars a year to live on. Right. We're, we're doing just fine. And so you have to put the money because I, I think this thing is going to keep growing and keep growing and keep, keep growing. I'd rather bet on myself, take our profits, reinvest, hold all of the basically the stock or equities. and won't give it up as long as I can until we then it would like right now. It doesn't make sense if we ever got to the point where there really is an expansion and we need this much capital to do it. And here's why. I'm not saying we would never do it, but we got a long runway that we can keep essentially reinvesting the profits into this before I would need outside money. You know, we use a local bank, like for a line of credit and that kind of stuff. And, you know, but, you know, we've been fortunate, like our, our, you know, our building that our production facility, not we've seen behind us is our fitting center. You know, I, I paid it off. It's, we have a 25,000 foot building that, you know, we own straight out. So I've always lived very conservative and I still have a nice house and a nice life. And, you know, we don't struggle to pay bills and we can take vacations. But I think as an entrepreneur, if you want to get the max value, at least for the businesses like yours and mine, that you can scale yourself. Right. I never just thought it made sense to, to dilute the equity. I'd rather just have it and reinvest those profits back into our own things has been the best return on investment yeah. I've had. So I'll, I'll bet on our team and ourselves of what we have going. Yeah, I, I love that. And, and that's the same for me, man. I never even considered out, outside money. Now, one of the things I did struggle with that I, that I go back and forth on wondering if I did it right or not. And I don't know if you, it's the hiring of other people, even with my own money, but hiring other people to, to help us, to help us grow. You know, do, do I spend X dollars on a, a salesperson to bring in. And for, for me, I always looked at it like, well, shit, if I pay somebody, you know, for our industry, it'd be like, say I had to pay him like 80 grand, you know, okay. But if he brings in, you know, a hundred grand of residual business after a couple of years or 200 grand, okay. But me training him, me working with him, all this shit. Oh gosh, that was taken away from my time. And it's also going to mess up our margins as, as, as a percentage. Now, later though, I ended up selling my company to private equity. And let's say I hired you, Jason, to work for me and I paid you 80 grand and you brought in 85 grand of revenue for us. Okay. I made five grand, not really worth my time when a multi-million dollar business, but right. when I sold it to private equity, they were buying us for a multiple, a high one of EBITDA of, of that profit. Mm -hmm. So that five grand now had a multiplier on it. So if it's right. only five grand, it's probably not still, still not worth it. But let's say it was, you made me 70 or made the company 70 grand a year, Jason. And I say just, I'm making up numbers, but say we sold it for 10 times EBITDA. Okay. Now when I sell now it, it's that's worth 700 yeah. grand for me. So, so one of the yes. things I question myself on, as I look back at my just my my decisions is okay had i known i was going to sell one day to private equity and this would be the formula would i have spent more time on that 
But remember, there's only 24 hours of it a day. I was still growing it on my own. I still would have had to hire those people, find them, and train them to do that. So, so let's, you know, I guess, sorry, I just kind of talked about myself there for five minutes. All you golf fans, I'm, I'm sorry. All you business people, hope you appreciated it. <laughs> um, but let, let's tie that back to you, Jason. So, no outside investor money. Are you doing all the sales yourself? Um, if, if you, if you, if you were no, going to scale, no. if you were going to scale, how are you going to scale? So now our guys are not on commission, okay. right? So they they just are there for customer support. So we have five guys in the office who take care of most of the customer uh, issues okay. that they have, right? I still handle some customers. Uh, if something goes up the scale, they need my help. Uh, at you know, at first I was more and more involved with more and more calls, but as it got bigger and bigger and bigger, literally I couldn't handle it anymore. From there's not enough hours in the day, so we've built that team up based on our sort of culture of taking care of the customer, put the customer first. Imagine it was like your brother-in-law that you liked. How would you treat them? Don't upsell to somebody who doesn't need it, right? Like put them first. So then you just build that team or we did with the same values. They get bonused at the end of the year. If we do well, they do well. But I don't want people fighting over because it's, it's it's not like insurance where you got your own client. The phone rings, emails come in. They're just taking care of us. We're all on the same yeah, team, basically. Love that. Then I have a... I've, because I've been doing this for so long, I have a vice president, Dan Peck, who's been with me for 23 years. He has a, you know, a, a part of the business, right? He's earned that over the years. So he kind of runs it all day to day and is very capable of running it. So that technically there's, he's the layer between the sales guys and me, even though we're a 25 person company, it's not that big. Right. So they can handle that stuff. Then I can focus on kind of product development, the branding, doing interviews, you know, like I'm kind of the face of the company. If Penny Hardaway calls and, you know, I'll take that thing and help him with his clubs or VIP kind of guys or our mutual friend we know, right? Where we make sure those guys get taken care of, that gets bumped up to me. So I can kind of be branding, messaging, where we're going, working with our social media team or those guys of, of, you know, how do we get the messaging out there? I do more of that anymore, but I still do club fittings a couple days a week in here, like for a few hours, just so I stay connected to the customers. I'll still yeah. call maybe six, seven customers a day. Yep. They might send me a, like, hey, boss, like he really wants to talk to you or this one's kind of complex or can you handle this one? Gotcha. I'll never stop doing that yeah. because it's it's important. I still, what's going on out there? What are we hearing? Yep. But as it's growing, I, you know, I, 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 I have to focus more as a CEO. Yeah. You know, that stuff is getting less and less, but I won't completely ever all give it up. You know, you know and, and, and isn't it interesting too? You have to walk that line a little bit, not to undermine the, 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 the people that, you know, are, are working for you, doing a good job, you know, okay. The, let them make that judgment call of, Okay, when yeah. do we pull Jason in? If you're looking over their damn shoulders, hey, what do you say? What do you say? Well, let me call him. You know what I mean? You start undermining your staff. And I got to tell you, though, man, it, it's tough as an entrepreneur, man. It's tough because you got to you gotta get that level of trust with each of your employees not to want to yeah. even think that way, right? Um, sounds like you're doing an incredible job with it, man. Well, we've tried to let, like, so Cody – you know, uh, runs and he's a young guy, he's 30. He's been with us for like five years, really smart guy. Good. I mean, blessed to have him. Right. Then we, once he can prove he can do it, then we let him hire and do it and give him the autonomy to do it. Cause I learned over the years when I got too involved in it, it just pissed people off. <laughs> so if you're trusting me to do it, boss, you gotta let me do yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. A year ago, my guys, you know, Dan was part of that team, sat me down, like a come to Jesus moment. Yeah. They're like, you're driving us nuts, right? Like you're asking us to do this. Then you come in a day later telling us how to do it. Yeah. And this isn't working for us because we can do this, but you have to let this go. And if we, if we mess up, then come in, but give us the chance to prove it right. Yep. We're here for you. We want to be on this team. You can't do it both ways, right? You can't have it both. So I, I learned a long time ago from my own mistakes of, you have to let smart, you know, try to get people smarter than you are. Don't be afraid of it. Know what you do well, and then surround yourself with people that can cover your weaknesses and give them the space, monitor it, but you got to give them the space. So what I, what I've done over the years is, uh, I don't go to the office hmm. unless I need to, oh, Okay, I work more from home Okay, because then my type A personality brain <laughs> doesn't start going 
asking everybody in that building yep. what's going on what's the right because right. they're not driving nuts yep. so our solution years ago was <laughs> only come in if you have to come in okay and i set up a home office years ago way before covid <laughs> and i'll go in the office for about two hours a day oh my gosh but that was like the that was what i needed yeah to not go type a anal yeah. over everything that's happening and that's how we've made it work. That if I'm not there, <laughs> <Leave him alone. laughs> I won't do yeah. it. Right. The temptation is just too much. So then I, I, I don't go in the office oh. unless I have something to do. Well, you know, there's some uniqueness to that for sure, right? You, you, you'd hear a lot of people say say the opposite. Be at the office, set that example, especially when you if you have some people that that might be a little bit younger working there. Um, that that's that's all. But Dan's there, yeah. right? My VP's gotcha. there all the time. Okay. So there's, that's the layer, yeah. right? So you yeah. still got that layer. Yep. And then in our culture at this point, everyone knows I ain't there. So the new guys, this is just laid into it, right? And, and I'm sure, you know, the, the guys have probably told the new guys, hey, he doesn't come in. <laughs> and trust me, you want it this way. <laughs> we had to come to Jesus meeting with him 15 years ago. And this is just how it works. I, I'm in so it, it kind of like self yeah. work. You know what I mean? Like there, I'm sure it's been laid out to the guys of why it's not out of laziness. It's like, he'll drive you crazy. <laughs> so. I'm envisioning you uh, showing up unexpected one day and you open the door and everyone starts fumbling their paper. Go oh, shit. There's people's feet on the desk. I'm totally, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> no, yeah. like, I, like, you know, you get older, you get chill, you know, like I, you know, it's, I'm pretty mellow with it anymore unless somebody does something just moronic, which <laughs> right. is rare. So, so yeah. I try to stay, I try to stay positive and more smiles than yelling or anything. Awesome, man. Well, listen, this is this has been incredible. Congratulations on all your success. I I usually leave an open-ended question, or we're open-ended in the sense of you could answer it any way you want with, with our guests on on to recommend a movie. And I say it doesn't have to be any certain genre, but if we have golf fans listening, like I'm sure we we do, how about I change this question slightly for you? Give us right. your top three golf movies and everybody DM or comment on why you agree or disagree, please. <laughs> well, the, two, the first, I got the third. I mean, the first two are so easy. Like Caddyshack's the greatest golf movie ever, right? Then you got to go Tin Cup. Gosh, the third one. There's some bad golf movies. I'd probably say Follow the Sun, the Ben Hogan story is great. Like it was done in the, I think, 60s, um, you know, after how he came back from the car accident. You know, and then won three major championships in one year for his 1953 season. That movie's fantastic. So I have someone in the so, studio here. Do we agree? Which one would you add? He agree. He agrees with those. But what what's it called? He said he would add Bagger, Bagger Vance. Maybe it's Bagger Vance. Or Happy Gilmore is great Happy too. Gilmore. But I'm such a Ben Hogan fan. I'd put Follow the Sun. But Caddyshack takes it by far. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a great. It's good. Incredible interview, man. We, 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 we covered a lot of ground there. Everybody, Jason Highland in the meeting notes. You'll see how to contact him um, and uh, be a, maybe be a sub-70 customer. Thank you very much. Hey, come on out to Stickmore anytime. I'm, I'm happy to buy you dinner, show you the facilities, and uh, you're, you're always welcome to come on out. Reach out anytime. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, John. And that wraps up another episode of 2000% Raise. Thank you for listening. The best way to support our show is by leaving a rating or review on all platforms you listened on. And of course, by following, liking, or subscribing. Visit us at 2000percentraise.com or at John Sarasani on TikTok and Instagram. And of course, my YouTube channel at John Sarasani's 2000% Raise. Find all the ways to follow today's guests in our show notes. Thank you for being a part of our entrepreneurial journey.